The title of chapter 15 is The Ferment of Reform and Culture. And uh, whenever we talk about the word reform, it means change. It's happened quite a lot in our history. We'll be talking about it um, a lot in this class. A period of reform, a, a, period, a reflective period where, you know, you look into yourself and say, could we do things differently? As a, as a country, we did that during the 1830s and 1840s. So it's, it's oftentimes deemed the reform period. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about how this started. Well, what's, what's going to happen during this reform period is we're going to have a second great awakening. And the second great awakening is going to, the cause of the second great awakening is going to be the same cause of, from the first great awakening, a liberalness in religion. The fact that people grew less religious over time. And, you know, the statement that the, uh, here at the top, the austere Calvinist rigor had long been seeping out of American churches. Well, Calvinist, uh, you know, they're the ones that were believers in predestination and uh, a strict lifestyle. People weren't as strict. They weren't believing in, in predestination again, right? This, if this is deja vu, then, you know, you're right. We've talked about this before with the first great awakening. Um, so people were questioning religion, you know, the, the liberal people were questioning religion and Thomas Paine wrote in the age of reason, declaring that churches were set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. They were set up for money. And, uh, there was still that frustration by a lot of people about the direction that churches were going. Uh, two classic examples of liberal, uh, liberalness and religion, two examples of individuals would be Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And both these men were very educated, very scientific. Uh, they were into science and, and, you know, oftentimes people who are into science, they want to have proof. They need proof to prove a hypothesis. And Jefferson and Franklin could never find that proof. So, but they did, they were not atheist. They, they did believe in a supreme being. Um, they became what's known as deists, uh, the beginnings of the um, uh, Unitarian church that we have today. Deists are, and are believers in a, a supreme being that created the universe, but doesn't control everything that goes on. So they, they believe in a supreme, supreme being. So some, some tenets, some uh, points of emphasis, uh, the, they, the deists believe God exists and should be worshiped. Service to humanity is the best form of worship according to deists, uh, service to humanity. Uh, there is an afterlife in which good will be rewarded and evil will be punished. It going away from the idea, the Calvinist idea of predestination, where you were, it was predetermined before you were born, whether you're going to heaven or hell. So deist obviously didn't believe that. And again, Jefferson and Franklin were the best known of them. So it brings, a, 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 you know, brings along this boiling reaction against growing liberalness and religion. Um, the old time timers, again, digging their heels in, and trying to have people become more religious. And then at the same time, you have those people who are, relig who are uh, liberal saying, hey, service to humanity is the best form of worship. Doing good deeds, best form of worship. So, you know, the Second Great Awakening becomes one of the most momentous religious movements in history, second only to the First Great Awakening. Um, here's what the biggest effects are of the Great Awakening. It's, it's the, this new wave of reform, um, people who wanted to do good works, prison reform, um, uh, temperance, which is the outright end or reduction in the consumption of alcohol, women's movements, women getting the right to vote, possibly um, women having more rights. Uh, and then, of course, the abolition of slavery. Maybe the biggest of all reform movements during the Second Great Awakening, the biggest effect was in the area of abolition. The ideas were spread through camp meetings and, and revivals, very similar to what was going on with the First Great Awakening. You had preachers um, similar to preachers like uh, Jonathan Edwards from the First Great Awakening. Yeah, they, were, they called them hellfire and brimstone sermons because there was a lot of yelling and screaming and emotion in these sermons. New York had so many of these revivals 
that they called it the burned over district. There were so many hellfire brimstone um, sermons. So if you look at all the different dots and different colors on this map right here, they each represent uh, different group camp meet meetings that, that occurred here. The Mormons, uh, one of the um, religions that come out of the Second Great Awakening, uh, you see where um, there are some blue dots there. And we'll talk more about the Mormons as we go. There's an example of what a camp meeting might look like. Peter Cartwright is one of the most well-known uh, preachers in the Second Great Awakening. He helped start the Second Great Awakening. by He personally baptized 12,000 people. He preached benevolence, which is goodness. Uh, later, he settled in Illinois. He ran against Abraham Lincoln for a congressional seat in 1846 and lost to Abraham Lincoln. Another of the greatest of the Second Great Awakening preachers was a man by the name of Charles Grandison Finney. He uh, was a former lawyer and a tremendous speaker. He denounced both alcohol and slavery, and he served as a resident at Oberlin College in Ohio. So the biggest effects, again, here we're going to go over them, is one, it widened the lines between classes and regions. The people who were involved in the Second Great Awakening and experienced revivals and things like that and would attend revivals tended to be those people who were the poor people in the country. Um, so you know, they were the ones that didn't have, they, they didn't have much on earth. So their, uh, you know, their reward was going to be heaven. So they tend, they tended to be lower, lower middle class people who were um, involved in the second great awakening. It brought on that wave of reform that we're going to be talking about so much in this chapter. And it also split denominations. Many de denominations were created. And uh, one of them being the Mormons, one of the few religions, one, one of a few one of only a few religions that were born here in America. Almost everything else came from another country, all other religions. So, yeah, the, here's your, your different areas of reform, the most well-known areas of reform right there, as I said, uh, temperance and, and the uh, prison reform, abolition, women's rights, and education. And we'll get into all of those here soon. Let's first talk about the Mormons, interesting group that uh, came out of the burned over district. So they started out, the Mormons were started out in, they started out in New York, burned over district. And it was uh, uh, 1830 when Joseph Smith reported that he had received some golden plates from the angel Gabriel and uh, translated those plates and it, became, and it became the Book of Mormon. No one has ever been able to find those plates, but apparently they were buried somewhere. Um, according to Mormon religion. Um, they were a, a group that was constantly um, attacked by different groups. Um, they were, there were people who were not happy with the Mormons, so they were always on the move. So they left New York, and they went to Ohio, and then Missouri, and then Illinois, and then finally they're to Utah, where many Mormons still live today. It's the growingest religion in America today. Um, it's, it's, their, their numbers are huge, especially in the Midwest, in places like uh, Utah, Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho. Their numbers are, are large. Uh, they, were, they aroused antagonism um, be, by a number of different ways. Uh, they oftentimes voted as a unit, which goes against the spirit of democracy in America. So people don't like them for that. Uh, they also have created their own militias for protection purposes because they were so hated by many groups. And of course, there is the issue of polygamy, where the in the beginning, when Joseph Smith created this religion in 1830, uh, one of the tenets of the religion was polygamy. Um, he believed that um, men should have more than one wife or could have more than one wife. Um, and that was a big reason why, for a long time, Utah didn't become a state. It wasn't until the Mormons uh, denounced polygamy. Uh, and then Utah finally got statehood after that. So polygamy is illegal. And the mainstream Mormons do not uh, believe in that anymore and don't practice that. Now, there are fundamentalist Mormon groups throughout the country that do practice this in pockets, little pockets in um, Utah, in southern Utah, in northern Colorado. 
um, but it is illegal and if they're caught they could be put in jail for that well joseph smith because of the antagonism that was directed at him as well as the mormons uh, was put in jail in uh, illinois in, in uh, illinois he was captured put in jail and then killed by an angry mob uh, in his place, uh, Brigham Young took over and led the Mormons out of Illinois and in search of their promised land. And their promised land came, in, uh, came to be Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, they came across a place that uh, in the middle of the, what they called the desert, and, uh, and, they, and they settled there in Salt Lake City and made it a prosperous community. Um, and then 1882 was when Utah uh was when finally got their statehood after they uh did away with polygamy so there's a picture of joseph smith on the left and brigham young on the right obviously brigham young university named after him there's the uh mormon trek where they started new york and you can see by numbers new york to ohio to missouri to illinois where joseph smith was killed and then on to salt lake um they had a proposed uh, state that they, that uh, was supposed to be all that area in, in green. Obviously, that didn't come to be. But today, <clears throat> in many of those areas, you still have large Mormon influences uh, in that green area. Pretty amazing church, the Mormon, uh, the Mormon church in Salt Lake. It's pretty amazing. If you ever have a chance to go there, you can't go in. Um, this is a, a church across the street from UCLA, down Southern California. All right, so the areas of reform that we're going to be discussing, education, colleges, prison reform, treatment of mentally ill, temperance, and abolition. Uh, we'll hold off on abolition until the next chapter. The next chapter will be dedicated to the reform movement known as abolition. So let's talk first about public education. Uh, obviously, you go to a private school here, and uh, you know your parents pay tuition. But your friends that might go to a pu public schools like Salinas High or North High or Alvarez or um, you know middle schools like Washington, San Benicio, there they have there's a tuition there, but the tuition is paid through tax dollars. So about the same amount that it costs your parents to send you to Palma, your, the state of California will pay for your friends to go to the public school. So public education was something that was promoted, uh, especially by Horace Mann here, and, uh, and then spread throughout the country. The first public schools were in Massachusetts. Uh, they were on the forefront of education, and you could probably understand why. I mean, it goes all the way back to when the uh, Massachusetts Bay settlers came, you know, and the, the the Puritans, and one of the things that was very important to them was education because they wanted their kids to be able to read the Bible. Uh, so Horace Mann became the first ever secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, and he campaigned for public schools, for more schools, for better schools, for qualified teachers. Uh, uh, the whole idea of teachers being credentialed comes from, um, from Horace Mann. Some of his philosophies when it comes to education that were new and different and liberal. Ch children were clay in the hands of teachers and school officials. Children should be molded into a state of perfection. And they discourage corporal punishment because that was common in a lot of schools like whippings and, you know, uh, use of, of spanking and things like that. And he discouraged that. And then he also state, established state teacher training programs where teachers could get certified like we have to. Colleges, more colleges were created during this time. Better colleges were created during this time. Colleges for uh, women, women were able to go to college. Um, Thomas Jefferson helped start Virginia, University of Virginia, which was a non-denominational college, very similar to Pennsylvania, which was started by Ben Franklin. So no coincidence that Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, uh, both followers of deism and uh, not being very religious, started, helped start colleges that weren't based on religion. North Carolina, uh, University of North Carolina, the Tar Heels became the first state college. Uh, women had more opportunities in education uh, that they'd never had before. 
Emma Willard established what's called Troy Female Seminary in New York. Uh, Oberlin College became the first ever co-educational college in America, in the United States, here in America. Mary Lyon established a woman's school at Mount Holyoke in uh, Massachusetts. So there's some names that you should be familiar with. Emma Willard, Mary Lyon, um, yeah, Oberlin College, Horace Mann. There's Emma Willard and Troy Female Seminary. And there's Mary Lyon in her Mount Holyoke. Uh, another woman who was very instrumental in bringing about reform in this country was Dorothy Dix, who uh, later on will serve as a nurse in the, the uh, Civil War. She was really uh, dismayed by the fact that people who were mentally ill were being chained to the bed. They were being put in prison cells. Um, she made the case in a speech, which is very uncommon for women to speak publicly at the time. She spoke to the Massachusetts, uh, a, a group in Massachusetts, and she talked about the need for uh, hospitals for the mentally ill, that mental illness is truly an illness and it's not a crime. So because of her work, because of her efforts, more hospitals were made. Um, and there's one right there. Uh, it's, called, it's in North Carolina, I believe. And it's called the Lunatic Asylum. Lunatic Asylum would be a word. We wouldn't use the word lunatic because it wouldn't be politically correct today. But at one time, it was a proper word to describe people who were mentally ill. Times change. Uh, an another really important um, reform movement was the reduction or even elimination of alcohol consumption. And the idea, it's called temperance. Um, the first state to go dry was Maine. And Neil Dow was the senator from Maine who established this bill, who helped bring this to Maine. Uh, one by one, the states are going to go dry until eventually um, in, in the early 1900s, the entire country goes dry. Um, so this is a, later on will lead to the 18th Amendment to the Constitution called Prohibition. Uh, there is a, a women's society, the, the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, that becomes very influential. Now, the reason they were talking about eliminating alcohol, it's, it's tough to pinpoint exactly when and where uh, it began. But many think it was in the South that the slave owners were afraid that slaves would get, get a hold of alcohol and possibly escape after, give them courage to escape. Um, it was a lot of times it was, you know, the, with the Industrial Revolution, there were uh, owners of factories that were concerned because workers were coming home drunk or coming to work drunk, sorry, and their efficiency was being cut down less and less. And then women's groups, too, because men were going out, getting drunk, coming home and abusing women. So those are some reasons why temperance caught on and you don't know exactly which one was the most influential but there's a few right there uh, so again neil dow is oftentimes called the father of prohibition because he established the first main law 